webinar series on the Hanford site. Uh, I'm Ken Miles. I'm the administrator of the Oregon Department of Energy's Nuclear Safety Division. And I uh, wanted to thank you for uh, participating, those of you who have been here throughout the entire five weeks, and welcome those of you who are uh, somewhat new. We've, uh, this has been the first time that we've done this. We've had a, a few technical issues we've had to work through in the first couple of, uh, couple of nights. We appreciate your patience and your feedback, and uh, we hope and think we've got the technical bugs worked out. So hopefully tonight we'll, uh, we'll just breeze through this. So tonight we're going to focus on transportation of radioactive materials. And believe it or not, uh, Hanford does not really play a huge and dominant role in transportation radioactive materials in the state right now. It has in the past. It will likely again in the future. Um, and we will talk a little bit about Hanford as well. So, but, but really, uh, I think you'll be surprised to find that, that when we're talking transportation of radioactive materials in the state, it is much more than just uh, the Hanford site. So we're going to close up tonight with our final part on transportation. At the end of that, we'll give you, as we have in each of these uh, uh, previous four webinars, we'll give you some public involvement tips and advice with uh, Becky Rubenstrunk. Uh, we'll go to questions, and we'll do it again by typing in questions. And, and if we see a clarifier as we're going through this, we'll try and, and stop and answer those. We've got a couple of audience interaction questions to pose your way as we, uh, as we roll along. Um, and then since this is the final night that, uh, that we're doing this, if there are questions that have come up, we'd like to hit the transportation topic first. After that, if there's questions about uh, anything that we've covered over the uh, entire five-week period or other nuclear issues that maybe we did not cover that, uh, that you'd like to raise as questions, we can take a shot at that. So that's the plan, um, and we'll get going. As you see, uh, you're looking at what I looked like before I got my ears lowered a few days ago. So it's changed a little bit. I have been working on Hanford issues uh, for 23 years. And I've been working on radioactive material transportation issues uh, for about 20 of those years. So I do have a lot of depth and, and experience in this, in this subject. I want to talk about the origins of the program that we have. And the, the state of Oregon has a radioactive material transportation permit program. And it goes back really to the late 1970s and the early 1980s when the state of Oregon through the legislature, through the governor's office, through this agency, recognized that there was a lot of shipments of radioactive materials traveling through the state. The state really didn't know a whole lot about them. They didn't necessarily know where they were going, although we, we assumed that, that Hanford was the destination in large part. We didn't know how many trucks were on the roads. We didn't know exactly what they were carrying. We really didn't know what routes they were using. And what was Further of a concern is we, we really did not have good information then to provide to emergency responders along the transportation routes if, in fact, there was an accident that occurred. We also had no funding source available to buy radiation detection equipment or provide training for these emergency responders. So in 1981, the Oregon legislature passed statutes to regulate the transportation of radioactive material. And it established a permit and a registration and a fee program uh, to address some of those issues I raised, that we didn't have a lot of information about what was on the road. The fee program would provide money then for the mandated training and emergency preparedness program, which was delegated basically to my agency, the Oregon Department of Energy, and co-delegated to the Oregon Health Division. Here is the statute that really explains the intent of the legislature to uh, enact legislation as far as the regulation of radioactive material transportation. It does talk about to the full extent allowable under and consistent with federal laws and regulations. And to be honest, it, we, there isn't a lot of leeway. Federal law really does dominate this field. 
and there have been a number of incidents over the years where states have been preempted because they've tried to reach too far in terms of what they were regulating. It can't be inconsistent with federal regulations. But still in saying that, there is room for state regulation of transportation of radioactive materials. So the statutes require a carrier of radioactive materials to obtain a state permit. And there's no fee for the permit. It's a relatively simple process if you have a good driving record for your trucking company. It does allow for collection of a fee, which then provides us that funding to uh, purchase radiation detection equipment, provide it to emergency responders, and provide training as well, which we've done over the years. The fee is, you might be surprised, is actually pretty small. It's only $70 per truck. Um, over the years, and you'll see in a few moments the number of shipments we've had, the $70 per truck has added up, has given us really a, a suitable and a sustainable funding stream, at least so far, to be able to do what we wanted to do. Requires my agency to produce an annual report on radioactive material transportation in the state, covering some of the highlights, what we saw, how many shipments, where they were going, um, a summary of incidents. Those are the types of things that, that I'll be covering with you tonight. Our most recent annual report is available on our Department of Energy website. And it also does require an emergency preparedness and response program to be, uh, to be established. Drug said no audio. So we are being told there is no audio. Uh, can folks raise their hands if you can hear me? And how do we get through that, guys? We're good. We go. We're good. OK. All right. Thank you. Good to hear, good to hear that. We, we got a wrong information that there was no audio. So we'll continue on then, assuming we've been good. Thought we had all these technical issues worked out. So in, in the state, and, and it's uh, not unlike other states, uh, the legislature passes a law, and then the state agencies pass administrative rules which give the details of how those laws will be enacted. So in Oregon, the administrative rules that we have, they apply to transport a radioactive material other than by rail car. Initially, when these administrative rules were enacted in the early 1980s, let me back up here. Going the wrong way. Initially, when we passed these uh, administrative rules, we did cover shipments by rail. We did a major update of these rules in 1991, and were informed, frankly, by the rail companies that uh, we would be preempted by federal law if we tried to enforce these against the railroad companies. Uh, we also found out there really wasn't much in the way of radioactive material shipments by rail. And rather than get into a prolonged legal battle with the railroad companies, we just dropped that provision from our administrative rules. So it, it does, they do not cover shipments by rail. Federal shipments and federal vehicles are also exempt. And what that predominantly covers is weapons, nuclear weapons shipments, made by the federal government. And those shipments do traverse the state of Oregon on occasion. They did back then when these administrative rules were passed. They do today. And the federal government has made it very clear that, that the states have absolutely no authority, nor do they want us to have knowledge of those shipments when they occur. Now, if you think federal shipments, the Hanford site is certainly a federal site, and they do ship waste. Uh, but they use commercial carriers. So those shipments do fall under the purview of our authority. When applying for a permit, a trucking company has to provide some pretty basic routine information, 24-hour uh, emergency number, description of the material and routes and frequency, uh, proof of insurance, description of any violation, things of that nature. That information then goes to the Oregon Department of Transportation, which is uh, known by the acronym ODOT. And ODOT does have the authority to not issue uh, a permit for radioactive material transportation in the state if the carrier has a bad safety record. And 
This has happened once or twice, not very frequently, but it has happened on occasion, and ODOT does have that authority to uh, not allow a company to transport radioactive materials within the state. Further requires inspection for certain types of shipments, and it's important to keep in mind, just like when we've talked about Hanford and different radioactive materials, not all radioactive materials are the same, nor are all radioactive material shipments. Uh, some have very high amounts of radioactive materials, and we'll talk a little bit about the differences later, and do pose potentially a large risk. Uh, a lot of the shipments have very small amounts of radioactivity and really don't pose much in the way of a threat. So there's different levels of radioactive materials that traverse the state. The notification requirement is just for the certain shipments, the ones that do have fairly high, le high levels of radioactivity, those do need to arrange for an inspection upon entering the state. The fee schedule I mentioned, uh, $70 per shipment. Basically, there's a couple of exceptions, but that's basically what happens. Uh, all of the packaging and placarding and labeling requirements, and I'll talk about some of those a little bit later, must be consistent with federal requirements. We basically defer to the federal government. And an important note, the trucking company is required to make immediate notification uh, of an accident or loss of radioactive materials. So we have had a few accidents over the years, for the most part relatively minor, and they've done a pretty good job at, at uh, notifying us when those have occurred. The Department of Transportation, ODOT, does carry out this, uh, this program for us in terms of gathering the information. They operate the ports of entry, uh, and that's where the trucking, uh, the trucks are required to stop when they enter the state and provide that information to us, which then gives us the information we've been, you know, that this whole program was set up to obtain, to know the numbers of shipments that we have, what routes are using, the type of materials that are being transported, the origin and the destination. There's a lot of radioactive materials on the highway in very small quantities that fall under the threshold that do not have to be part of our reporting system or our permit program. There's small amounts of radioactive materials on the roads every day of the year, uh, going to hospitals and medical centers at construction sites, uh, road construction sites particularly. Uh, a lot of industry, lumber mills especially, have, uh, have radioactive materials that they use within their processes. And then there's research labs and public works departments, universities, a lot of others that do have small amounts of radioactive material that again fall under the threshold of, of needing to be part of our permit program. As an example, there's over 100 medical facilities in the state that have a radioactive material licenses. Now the use and the uh, possession of these radioactive, material license, uh, radioactive materials is licensed by the state health division, uh, but again the transportation part of it is a little bit different. They still have federal requirements they have to meet. They just don't fall within our permit program. When you look at the shipments that do and the numbers of shipments that do, here is the historical record of the, the numbers of shipments that we've seen over the years. The permit program began in 1982. It was not for an entire year. That's why we have the plus above that. So we know it was more than 2,000 shipments during that first year. Then you know, that's obviously why this program began. That many shipments traveling through the state definitely got our attention. In later years, you can see, actually it didn't take too long before you saw a fairly significant decrease in the number of shipments. And you can see, though, we're still at, you know, three, four, five, 550 shipments a year in the state. And we're going to stop now for our first question for you. And we're going to have you guess what part of the state experiences radioactive shipments most frequently. And there's four choices for you to, uh, to choose from. The Portland area, the Willamette Valley, Northeast Oregon, and Central Oregon. So I'll let folks weigh in on where they think the most number of shipments are within the state of Oregon. And it does change year by year, but the number one answer will be the same year after year as I'll go through it. So we got uh, some people 
inputting their votes. We see the numbers jiggling around. Looks like people are changing their minds maybe a little bit. Don't overthink it. So let's lock that in, show you the results. So we're going to close that poll. And the number one answer is Northeast Oregon, which is the correct answer. Portland area and the Willamette Valley actually get very few shipments, for the most part, with one exception. I'll talk about that as well. We've had over the years, especially in recent years, we've had a lot of concern by people in Portland, and a lot of concern by people in the Columbia Gorge that uh, have been told in public meetings by uh, some people trying to get people upset about this topic that there are huge numbers of shipments going through the Portland area and through the Willamette Valley. And it's really not the case, and I'll, I'll go through that with you. So as we look at a map of the state of Oregon, and we look at the numbers for the first nine months of this year, so 342 shipments we've had this year so far in the first nine months, and you can see Interstate 84 in Northeast Oregon is, is very easily the, the primary transportation corridor. You look on the western side of the state, I-5 FedEx is radioactive pharmaceuticals that are used for medicine treatment and diagnosis that are flown into the Portland Airport for the most part and then are distributed by Federal Express. So that makes up really the majority of the shipments on the western side of the state. Gorge has very little, Central Oregon and I-5. It's not been the case all along, and I'll show you back year by year, but, but what you, we've seen so far this first nine months of this year is pretty representative of what we've had for the last several years. So if we look at last year, you know, that 80% and 79% Northeast Oregon, you know, the, the percentages really are, are pretty static. If we go back another half dozen years, back to 2005, a fewer number of shipments overall. So the FedEx shipments, which are pretty constant, picks up a higher percentage, and it took that away from, from I-84. But you can see, again, the western side of the state, Columbia Gorge, not a whole lot of shipments. Go back a little bit farther to 2000, and here we do see a number of shipments in the Columbia River Gorge. And the reason for that was the shutdown of the Trojan nuclear plant northwest of Portland and the decommissioning of that facility with a lot of that waste going to a commercial site that's located on the Hanford site, which I'll show you some pictures of and talk about uh, in a little bit later. Go back further to 1993. This was right after Trojan shut down as decommissioning was just basically winding up. And again, we see a substantial number of shipments in the gorge. And, and why that's important to us to know where these shipments are is when this came up, we were able to then focus some additional training throughout the Columbia River Gorge to the emergency responders in that part of the state uh, and recognizing that they were more likely to experience an accident and have to respond to an accident. So it, it allows us to, to know where we need to do the most training. So if you go, go back even farther to 1988, here is really the first time going back over this history we've had where you see a lot of shipments coming up through the western side of the state. And the main reason is that this commercial low-level waste disposal site located at Hanford, up until 1992, could take waste from any state in the United States. In California, you know, given the size of, of all the industry and commerce and research and everything else in California, not surprising, they do produce a lot of radioactive waste. In 1992, Congress passed a law called the uh, uh, Low-Level Waste Policy Act, which then forced states into regional compacts to deal with their low-level radioactive waste problems. California was not one of those states that then had access to that waste disposal site. So in the, in the late, early, mid, late 1980s, we saw a lot of shipments coming up in the western side of the state, in the central part of the state, beginning at the end of 1992 when that access was shut off to that disposal site 
we've really seen very little coming up on, on the western side of the state. So when we began this program, and for a number of years through this program, really most of the shipments were associated with two different low-level waste disposal sites located within a few miles of each other on the Hanford site. One operated by the U.S. Department of Energy, and it took waste from other federal government sites around the country. And one is this commercial disposal site operated by a commercial company, which again until 1992 was able to take waste from hospitals and universities and industry from throughout the United States. Since 1990, the beginning of 1993, has been able to take waste from only 11 western and Rocky Mountain states. So let me show you where those are, what they look like. This is a, a Google Earth image of basically the Hanford site. You see the line at the top that curves around is the Columbia River. Uh, and then on the right-hand side basically forms the eastern boundary of Hanford. And we're going to look in the center part of the Hanford site, what's called the Central Plateau, the 200 West, and the 200 East areas. And actually in between those areas is the commercial disposal site operated by a commercial company called U.S. Ecology. And don't mistake that for one of the regulators at, at uh, Hanford, the Washington Department of Ecology. It's not a state agency, it's a commercial company. Again, from the Google Earth view, here's what that disposal site looked like. I believe this is from earlier in this calendar year that that photo was taken. And another view. And then a photo from uh, ground level when I visited the site back in 2007. So they're just uh, large trenches that have been dug out of the ground. You can see at the top of the uh, at top of the trench, not quite in it, is a number of barrels, small 55-gallon drums. Down in this disposal area is much larger uh, concrete-filled uh, uh, containers holding radioactive waste and another picture from the U.S. Ecology site. So if you look at their disposal volume, you can see that after 1992, the disposal volume did drop dramatically. And it was not just the elimination of all those other states that could send waste to the U.S. Ecology site that resulted in this continuation of a, of a decline. It's also because they get so much less waste than they used to, they've had to raise their disposal fees, which has incentivized those companies that produce radioactive waste to produce less or to compact it so they can make fewer shipments. And so we've seen a lot less, uh, a lot less waste, especially over the past uh, decade. And the indications we get are that this very low level of waste volume is what we'll continue to see uh, for the next few decades to come. The U.S. Department of Energy, again going back to this map of the Hanford site, and again looking at the Central Plateau, 200 West and 200 East areas. If we go into the 200 West area, we can see all this kind of gray disturbed land is old burial grounds. And there are over 300 trenches at Hanford that were used for disposal of of solid waste. A lot of this waste originated at Hanford. A lot of the waste as well came from other sites around the country. And there are disposal areas not only in the 200 west area at Hanford, but also a lot of them in the 200 east area as well. You can see they're, they're all over the site. And if you put these burial grounds end to end, uh, it's about 43 miles in length of trenches filled with low-level radioactive waste. And some, some of that waste is really pretty radioactive. In the mid to late 1980s, uh, the folks at Hanford used to send me just an email notification when they were expecting to get shipments of waste from other Department of Energy sites. So you can see here, there's Rocketdyne of California, uh, made some shipments. Uh, this is 1998. General Atomics is a DOE facility in California. Rocketdyne as well, a, a DOE Department of Energy facility in California. Uh, site in New Jersey. Uh, Fermi Labs is a federal facility in Illinois. 
Uh, Knowles Atomic Power Lab is in New York State. Brookhaven Labs in New York State. Uh, and then Paducah in Kentucky. So you can see, and, and these are all from 1998, you can see that Hanford did receive a lot of waste from Department of Energy sites all over the country. Uh, Department of Energy wanted to continue this and actually expand the amount of waste they brought to Hanford for disposal. They issued a record of decision in 2000 which designated Hanford and a site in Nevada to receive potentially tens of thousands of shipments of waste of low-level and mixed low-level waste for disposal. And not surprisingly, that had folks in the Northwest uh, pretty upset about that idea. It did lead to litigation, and uh, the combination of litigation and a very convoluted path from there has resulted in a moratorium in which the U.S. Department of Energy has agreed not to try and act on that record of decision to bring more waste into Hanford, with some very limited exceptions, until at least the waste treatment plant, uh, which you've heard about numerous times over the course of this webinar series, until the waste treatment plant to vitrify Hanford's high-level waste is operating, which is going to be at least 2022 and most likely many years beyond that. So the Department of Energy will not rule out bringing more waste to Hanford in the future. Um, but one thing going for us in this respect is by 2022, we'll have had 20-some years of cleanup of all these other DOE sites, many of which will have been completely cleaned up. And the waste volume that could potentially come to Hanford from this action is, is much, much lower than we would have seen had they been able to act on that in 2000. So if Hanford's not making shipments right now, or receiving waste right now, and the U.S. Ecology site has seen a tremendous decrease in shipments, what is it then that we're seeing in terms of radioactive material shipments in the state? And I did indicate at the beginning of this webinar tonight that we're really seeing a lot less impact from Hanford. So let's go back to the Google Earth map of the Hanford area, and instead of going on the Hanford site, this time we're going to go just south of the Hanford site, uh, still within the city of Richland, Washington. And there are two commercial facilities, one called Areva and one called Permafix, which are responsible now for a fairly significant number of shipments that we're seeing through the state of Oregon. A little bit better view of both of these facilities. So Areva manufactures nuclear fuel for nuclear power plants. And they convert a material called uranium hexafluoride to new reactor fuel. So we see shipments that we're able to track, again, with these documents we get at the ports of entry. We see uranium hexafluoride, which is actually more of a corrosive hazard than it is a radioactive hazard, uh, come into the state from the eastern United States. So these shipments are exclusively coming across northeast Oregon. When they get to Areva, the material is then used to make new uranium fuel for nuclear power plants. And uranium fuel, you've probably heard, you know, spent nuclear fuel, highly radioactive. When the fuel is new, actually, it's not very radioactive. It's not until after it's gone into a nuclear reactor, gone through the fissioning process, that it creates a lot of these radioactive materials and becomes highly radioactive. So the uranium hexafluoride inbound, the new nuclear fuel outbound, and again, we're able to track the direction and the location that goes through our ports of entry. Most of that new nuclear fuel goes back out Interstate 84 to the eastern United States. A small amount of it, small percentage of it, goes to the far east and is transported through western part of Oregon State and then goes south to California and to the Port of Oakland in California. So we're able to see what we're seeing in terms of, of the shipments. There are also a number of shipments involving empty containers that are going, you know, they, they come in full, they leave empty, they still have small amounts of residual radioactive material, so they still are placarded. They carry that yellow uh, diamond-shaped sign that you see to provide information to emergency responders. So we're seeing a lot of shipments associated with Areva uh, of three kinds, uranium hexafluoride, the new nuclear fuel, and then the empty shipping containers. Permafix is a commercial company that does treatment of 
low-level radioactive waste, and they do not have the same restriction that the disposal site has. They are allowed to take radioactive waste from any state in the United States, although we really haven't seen much come up from the western side of the state. We haven't really seen much come up from California going to permafix. What we've typically found is shipments coming from sometimes as far away as the East Coast, where they bring material to permafix. It goes through a treatment process, and in some cases it's a thermal treatment. It's not an incinerator. Think more like an oven, where this material is put into a, a very hot container where it, it uh, in some cases destroys chemical constituents that you have in here. And then the ashes and the resulting waste is then transported back either to the place of origin or to disposal sites in other states. So we're not seeing a whole lot of shipments uh, associated with permafix, uh, more than we had in the past, and we'll probably continue to see a, a steady number involving this facility. There have been some shipments of waste leaving the Hanford site. Uh, transuranic is a type of waste that we've talked about a little bit in, in past webinars. For purposes of what we've seen come from Hanford, for the most part, it's been contaminated clothing, uh, contaminated with small amounts of plutonium. Uh, it's not tremendously radioactive. It's not tremendously uh, uh, that hazardous. There, there are types of, of transuranic waste still at Hanford that do provide a bit more of a hazard that we'll eventually see leave the site, but not for a few years. These shipments as well are limited to Northeast Oregon through an agreement between the Western states working through the Western Governors Association and the Department of Energy. So we see these shipments going only through, uh, uh, through Northeast Oregon. For 2012, it's not an incomplete number. It is a zero. And uh, by the end of this calendar year, that will still be a zero. They've put these shipments on hold from Hanford for a couple of years. They want to uh, uh, devote their resources, their train drivers, their trucks, uh, towards emptying a few other Department of Energy sites around the country. Beginning about 2014 or 15 or 16, we're not exactly sure when, we'll start seeing shipments uh, begin again from, from Hanford. And at that point, Hanford will be the predominant supplier of this waste to the disposal site in New Mexico. And we'll likely see two or three times as many shipments in a given year for a fairly extended period of time. There's a lot of transuranic waste at Hanford yet uh, that needs to leave the site. And there's a picture of, of one of the trucks uh, going up. For those of you familiar with Northeast Oregon, that's Cabbage Hill, just, uh, just east of Pendleton. So I mentioned early on that uh, we had not put rail under our permit program, both because there wasn't a lot of shipments and because the railroad company said, we'll preempt you if you try. We really don't have much in the way of shipments of radioactive materials by rail. Neither the US Ecology site nor the Hanford site have ever accepted uh, waste by rail. So we, we haven't seen large volumes of shipments. What you're seeing here is a shipment of irradiated nuclear fuel from Navy warships that is shipped by the Navy. Uh, it does go through the state of Oregon. They're considered national security shipments. We know what they are. We know where they're going. We know the route they're using. Uh, they don't tell us the schedule. Uh, as you can see visually, they're pretty unique looking. Uh, if you look at the end of the train, they're also unique in that there aren't too many cabooses out on the railroad tracks any longer. That's where the armed escorts are. And they have talked to us, the Navy has talked, especially in recent years, they've opened up a lot more about these shipments. They had a, a transportation exercise involving these shipments in the Vancouver, Washington rail yards uh, just last summer, actually summer of 2011. And a lot of local agencies in the Portland area, including the Portland Hazardous Material Response Team and the Clark County uh, Response Team and Vancouver Fire, Vancouver Police, State of Washington, State of Oregon, a lot of other participants um, just walking through what they would do in the event of an accident involving one of these shipments. And uh, in this case, especially 
finding out what the armed escorts would do, how to interact with those folks. So it was a very, very good exercise that we had there. There are some shipments on the river, uh, very few of radioactive materials. This is the decommissioned reactor compartment of a nuclear-powered submarine, and it is going up to the Hanford fight site for disposal. Uh, we have had over 100 of these go up to Hanford, and they go into this very large pit. Uh, what they do before they ready these for shipment is they remove the nuclear fuel. Uh, they fill the void space with a, a grout material, uh, remove all contamination that they can, and then they put steel plating on either side of this compartment, which is just basically cut right out of a submarine. And they've had some, some uh, compartments as well from nuclear-powered cruisers. Used to have a lot of these uh, back in the 90s as the United States Navy was working to catch up on decommissioning uh, a whole host of, of uh, old and mothballed nuclear-powered warships. As you can see, in recent years, they got through that backlog. We only see typically one or two shipments a year, and we'll continue to see that level of shipment for, uh, you know, for the years to come, most likely. We're going to go to our second question for you. And we're going to ask you where you think, in the state of Oregon, is the largest source of radioactive material waiting for transport. So if you think about what's in Oregon, you've got uh, four choices we've given you. There's a research reactor at Oregon State University, in case some of you didn't know that. There's uh, the shutdown Trojan nuclear plant uh, northwest of Portland. There's a waste transfer station that serves the Portland metropolitan area. And then Oregon Health Sciences University does a lot of different research and uh, medical treatments involving radioactive materials. So we'll give you a few moments to make your choice. We'll wait for the numbers to stop dancing. And all right, we're going to close it and right, we closed it. All right, let's look at the results. So the um, the leading choice with Oregon Health Sciences University, and actually the the uh, the real answer is the tr shutdown Trojan nuclear plant. Um, there is some waste at Oregon State University; very small amount they ship out when they they have enough to ship. Same with Oregon Health Sciences University, and Portland Waste Transfer Station really doesn't handle radioactive material, so kind of a kind of a trick answer there, if you will. At Trojan. They do have, the site has been all torn down and all cleaned up with the exception of what's called an ISFC, an independent spent fuel storage installation. So the spent fuel assemblies, highly radioactive material, which was previously stored underwater, has now been placed in large uh, canisters. They have 24 of these, actually 34 canisters and 24 fuel assemblies in each. Here's what it looks like at, uh, at the Trojan site. You can see the Columbia River in the background. This is all that's left at, at uh, Trojan, is these large concrete and steel containers holding millions of curies of radioactive materials uh, because there is no place to take them. Uh, the federal government, under federal uh, radioactive material policies, the plan for this material, and the plan for a lot of the highly radioactive material at Hanford as well, is to go into deep geologic disposal, to be buried deep underground where it can be isolated from people in the environment. Unfortunately, we don't have a deep geologic disposal site in the United States for high-level waste or spent nuclear fuel. We do have a geologic disposal site for transuranic waste, which I talked about earlier, the type of waste, the, the plutonium-contaminated protective clothing and, and other such material there is a deep geologic disposal site operating in the state of New Mexico that receives that waste. There's a lot of push and supposition and uh, expectation that perhaps the mission for that disposal site might be expanded to at some point take waste from sites like Trojan. We don't know if that will happen. 
but in the meantime, it sits under guard at the Trojan site. Eventually, if it leaves hand for, or Trojan, and, and I guess I should say when it leaves Trojan, uh, it will have to be shipped by rail because of the large size and weight of these canisters. They'll be placed into a transportation overpack, and, uh, and it will be moved out of there. It will be a big deal. You'll know this is going on. Uh, we will spend most likely several years in planning and preparation. There will be probably public meetings and a lot of exercises. You will not know most likely the specific day or time of the shipments when they occur, but you'll know what's going on. and There will have to be a place to ship it first. So let's go to our third question. We're going to change change the direction a little bit and talk a little bit more about the regulations and a little bit about the way that radioactive materials are transported and packaged. So the question I see a few of you have answered already is, do federal transportation regulations allow some level of radiation to escape from the transportation shipping package? So just three choices in this case, yes, no, or only for federal government shipments. So we're going to close the poll here, look at the results, and looks like about two-thirds of you said yes, and that is the correct answer. Uh, some level of radiation is allowed to escape from uh, the transportation shipping package. Now that doesn't mean an aerosol, that doesn't mean a gas, it doesn't mean a liquid. That's not the type of, of thing we're talking about. We're talking more about uh, the radiation, uh, the gamma rays and the, the radiation that would emanate uh, from, a, from a shipping container. So federal regulations under the U.S. Department of Transportation do allow this to occur. And an exclusive use vehicle is where the highest limits are. So I'm going to show you what those are and what those mean. And this has been an issue in recent years. Again, as I mentioned, people in Portland and the Hood River area especially have been told that there are a lot of shipments that have been occurring through their area and that people can be irradiated from them. So I. I hope I've shown to you that, that really there aren't that many shipments going through Port under Hood River. And I'd like to address this issue about whether or not the shipments that do go through these areas are in fact radiating people as, as they go by. So under the federal U.S. Department of Transportation regulations, an exclusive use vehicle is allowed to have, and I'm going to visualize this for you in a bit, so just stick with me there. Radiation level can be 200 millirem per hour at the surface of the vehicle, 10 millirem per hour at a distance of about two meters, so about six and a half feet. What that extrapolates out, because the radiation levels decrease very quickly with distance, it's about 20 feet from a shipping container that is at the regulation limit of 200 millirem per hour would be about one millirem per hour in a distance of 50 feet, it would be less than one-fifth of a millirem. So let me show you visually. This is actually a shipment of spent nuclear fuel coming through the state of Oregon. It's uh, inside that shipping container. There's a, a very robust shipping cask inside that metal box. Under the federal regulation limits, 200 millirem per hour is the maximum that's allowed at the surface. And if you take that out again to about two meters, you could have 10 millirem per hour. And it, it's very difficult to, you know, to really quantify what what a dose is because, um, you know, there there's a lot that's still not known about, or definitively at least, about the effects of low levels of radiation exposure to people. You know, the the bottom line is avoid unnecessary exposure. And, and that's really what most of the, the workplace rules uh, enforce and emphasize. 
at the same time, though, some level of exposure is allowed. So on average, we receive a, a, an average person in the United States just from natural background radiation will receive about 350 millirem per year, so about one millirem per day. It doesn't mean it's, it's good exposure, bad exposure. That's just kind of the average of what a person would get. And then there may be additional exposures from, from medical treatments. So if you think just in terms of one millirem per day and put into context the numbers I'm, I'm talking about here, so 10 millirem per hour, so you would have to stand that close to that cask for one hour to get that 10 millirem dose. What we're seeing with the shipments that we've experienced is the numbers don't even come close to approaching uh, the regulatory limits. So instead of 200 millirem per hour, what we're seeing is just a, a fraction of that amount. And we have not had, through the state of Oregon, a lot of what you would call highly radioactive shipments. Uh, in the last 20 years, we've had, I would say, five highly radioactive shipments through the Portland area, of which this is one of them. Um, and when you get to that point, they really don't have that high level of radiation. What? It just did. Oh, okay. And then if you look at two meters, the numbers that we're seeing, again, are very, very low. And then when you extrapolate that out to you know, 50 feet or 100 feet, you know, somebody standing by the side of the road or somebody standing at a gas station that's by the side of the road, uh, the dose really is zero. And, you know, it doesn't matter if you're, you're a child or an adult, you're more susceptible or not, you know, exposure to zero is, is still zero. So again, some of these examples, specific examples of shipments we've seen uh, a cobalt shipment that we had go through the western side of the state in 2004. Cobalt is used, it's a very radioactive material used to uh, irradiate medical supplies and things like that. Again, that number 200 millirem allowed at the surface, in this case way, way below that. We had some shipments, I, I mentioned earlier in talking about the transuranic waste that has been leaving Hanford that's been mostly contaminated clothing, there is a type of transuranic waste that is more highly radioactive called remote handled transuranic. And it was, uh, we had two shipments that came through the west side of the state going up to Hanford back in 2002. Uh, that's truck number one being inspected at the port of entry in Ashland as it entered the state of Oregon. You can see the numbers again, virtually nothing, uh, especially when compared to that regulatory limit and truck number two had no detectable level, levels uh, at the surface uh, or at two meters. Um, again, because we've not had that many shipments in Oregon, I've kind of reached out to my neighboring states to find out what they're seeing. Uh, again, some of this remote handle transuranic waste uh, coming from the Idaho National Laboratory in eastern Idaho, not traveling through Oregon, but within the region, traveling down to this uh, disposal facility, uh, again, the, the level's really pretty small. And we're going to change tax here and go to our fourth question for you. And the fourth question is, again, changing tax on you a little bit here, what's considered the most important safety measure for radioactive material transport? We give you four choices. Uh, the drivers, avoiding bad weather, you know, well-maintained special trucks, or the shipping container itself. So we'll give you a moment there, and we're just about to close. And let's close it and show the results. So a little over half of you said the shipping container. Actually, 
the uh, the answer in, in that is the correct answer, but all of them are important, and all of them are things that we try and stress, uh, especially for those shipments that do have fairly high levels of radioactivity. We, the, the state has really pushed back, working through uh, the Western Governors Association with other Western states and working through other organizations around the country, has really pushed back on the federal government, you know, to get the best drivers, the best trained drivers, to get the, the best quality trucks and to avoid snow and ice and, and to do a lot of other things. For the shipping container, we're going to, this is kind of the last thing that we're going to talk about here on transportation before we go to, um, before we go to uh, talking about public involvement. So packaging really is the key thing in all this. Everything else is, is important as well. The packaging the level of radioactive material thus results in the level of packaging required. So small quantities that don't really pose much of a hazard can be shipped sometimes in cardboard boxes because if there was an accident and if it was spread out, the consequence would be so small that it's not worth the expense and, and everything else to put it in something more robust. Large amounts of radioactive materials do need to be uh, transported in much tougher containers. So there are different types of packaging. In this case, uh, it's called an accepted package. Uh, and, and it can be, as I mentioned, a cardboard box, in some case, again, for very small amounts of radioactive materials. Type A package steps it up a little bit more. Uh, type A package can be a 55-gallon drum or a steel box, such as that. Um, they really have to just be able to withstand normal handling and very minor accident conditions, again, because the quantities that are allowed to be shipped in these types of containers cannot be very large. Then we move to the very robust, you know, many thousands or tens of thousands of pounds of steel and lead shielding called the Type B package. And these are very, very robust uh, transportation packages. And there are requirements that they must be able to withstand uh, certain forces that might be experienced in a severe accident. And I'm going to show you a little bit of video. Hopefully the video will work on this, uh, but of a free drop, so a 30-foot free drop onto an unyielding surface. And I want to focus on that a little bit, this unyielding surface. 30-foot drop, you know, we've all driven on, on freeways and highways and seen bridges and, and drops far greater than 30 feet. So let me explain in a moment the, the importance of that drop onto an unyielding surface uh, where all of the energy is borne by the shipping container itself. Must also survive a 40-inch free drop onto a 5-inch diameter steel rod, uh, striking the package in its most vulnerable spot. Uh, fully engulfing fire, 1,475 degrees Fahrenheit for 30 minutes and then immersion of the package under 50 feet of water for at least eight hours. These, acts, or these conditions for testing, for requirements, they're not intended to mimic a specific accident condition you might find on the highway. So it's not, you know, a 30-foot free drop is not supposed to imitate a 48-mile-an-hour collision or a 72-mile-an-hour collision or anything like that. What they are intended to do is encompass the forces that you could encounter in a severe accident condition. So here's some photos of some of the testing that's been done. And there have been both the, the four conditions I just talked about. These, these are regulatory conditions. So these are the types of conditions that a shipping container must meet to be able to be certified to carry these large amounts of radioactive materials. There have also been some tests that have been more dramatic uh, to demonstrate some, you know, some really severe accidents that aren't of a regulatory nature are a more of a demonstration nature. So they, for example, they put a 22-ton cask on a flatbed semi-trailer, crashed it into a concrete block at 84 miles an hour. You can see the pictures there cask maintained its containment after the impact. Again, this is not a regulatory test. 
It's a test to try and look at a very severe accident and see what would happen. Likewise, they had a 25-ton cask on a semi-trailer laid across railroad tracks, struck by a locomotive traveling at 81 miles an hour. The cask got dented up a little bit, but it maintained its containment. So let's see if we can get these videos to work. This is the regulatory testing of a type B cask and the 30-foot drop onto an unyielding surface. And again, a 30-foot drop, you know, does not look all that dramatic. And there's the, the drop onto the puncture. And you can see here, this is where it did the drop in the 30-foot, and now the puncture in the same general area. And now the fully engulfing fire for 30 minutes, 1,425 degrees Fahrenheit. This is a shipping container. It's a type B cask called the True Pack 2. And it's used to um, – why we're showing black on our screen. I hope you're able to see this. On my computer, it's showing good. No, apparently not. All right, so we'll just, uh, let's move on with that one. Sorry, we're not seeing the video. We'll try another one, not seeing that one either. All right, so let's move on then. All right, so – Sorry those didn't work for whatever reason. Still have some technical issues to work through. But we will post these on the website. It's just a little, little harder. You won't have the description of what, what I'm trying to talk you through. So we're going to come back to questions on transportation. Let's uh, go to Becky for a few minutes on public involvement while I catch my breath. And then uh, we'll try and get to your questions on transportation, and then anything else that you want to wrap up this, uh, this five-week series with. All right. Hello, everyone. So it's the last week, and before we get started on public involvement, I just have a few announcements, if you will. First, if you could please fill out the survey that we sent out. It's really the only way we can get good feedback about what you guys thought, what you liked, what you didn't like, and maybe what we could change for the future. This is the first time we've done anything like this, and so your feedback is really, really important. Next, if you could contact me by tomorrow if you want a certificate of completion, that would be very, very helpful. And if you want it paper mailed to you to your home, make sure you provide me with the address you'd like for me to send it to you. And if you have already emailed me, you don't have to email me again. And then also, I just wanted to let you know that we'll be updating our division webpage soon, and we'll put everything from the uh, webinar series up on the page, including the presentations, recordings of the presentations, and all of the fact sheets and things like that. So um, let's get started with this week. We're going to be talking about other organizations and ways to get involved. So. The Oregon, Oregon Department of Energy, we are a good resource and we'd love for you to stay in contact with us. But there are plenty of other organizations around Oregon and Washington that you can get involved with. Um, we'll just go through a few of the opportunities that uh, these organizations offer. Let's start with Hanford Challenge up in the top left-hand corner. Liz Matson actually wrote a note for you all that I included in your email. So they actually write the Say What guides that we've talked about, and they're involved with the Inheriting Hanford program, the program with the mentors. And so they're a great resource. They have other activities that are more social in nature, like happy hours and things. And sometimes those take place in Washington, but they're a good resource to keep in contact with. Columbia Riverkeeper, for example, over here, I guess on the right side, right center of the page, they have monthly meetups in the Portland-Vancouver area to talk about what's going on at Hanford. And they also do a, a paddling trip through the Hanford Reach in the summer, so that's an interesting way. Heart of America Northwest has volunteer opportunities, internship opportunities. The Department of Ecology has a plethora of different ways to get involved in terms of making uh, information about public meetings available to you, and they have a lot of social media that you can follow. And last but not least is the Department of Energy. Right now they actually have a public at large seat open on the Hanford Advisory Board and they're accepting applications. 
So if you do want to devote some time and learning more and getting more involved in a very hands-on way, the Hanford Advisory Board is looking for a public at large member. So you can find that application on their website. So let's talk about some ways you can just tonight or tomorrow you can start doing your own thing and finding new ways to get involved in bringing your community together around Hanford. The first way is if you have any questions or you want to get in contact with me about Hanford, because I'll be leaving the Oregon Department of Energy at the end of the month, feel free to email me at my email address, hanfordbecky at gmail.com. You can also email one another, and this is really important tonight. If you want to have your email address available to the other participants in the Hanford Leadership Initiative, just email me your address, and I will put a contact sheet together, and then you all can stay in contact and even maybe start a Facebook page and keep each other in the know about what you have going on. If you see news articles, things like that, you can share them on Facebook. So remember to email me your email address if you'd like to stay in contact with one another. You could also ask a, an organization on your campus or on your, at your high school or college, university, to sponsor a lecture. You can ask your professor to host a lecture in their class about Hanford and get in contact with one of the many, many resources that we've provided you, and you can have an expert come talk to your class. Like I said, you can apply to be on the Hanford Advisory Board. You could also host a happy hour, and you could do this at a cafe. You could do it at a public setting. You can do it at a restaurant, and really any place that you feel comfortable, make a few posters, let your professors or teachers know, maybe even put an ad in the free section, the calendar in your community newspaper and just let people know that you've got an event going on and you're just all getting together to talk about Hanford. And again, a great opportunity to call on the resources of the um, Inheriting Hanford program if you'd really like somebody there that um, you think would help you facilitate that meeting. Next way to get involved is just to talk to your friends and family. Let them know what's going on there and act as a resource. Again, now you all have so much information, so take what you know and share it with your friends and family and your classmates. Another good way is to just contact the organizations through their websites or social media sites. These I've shared with you some of, some of the ones that I'm most familiar with, but there are lots of other organizations that you can contact, and their information is um, on the Hanford Advisory Board website. But all of these organizations are excited to have people who want to get involved. So follow them on Facebook visit their websites, get to know what's going on, look at their calendars, they, they, they want you to get involved, so do. You can also, this is so easy, is sign up for news updates through your search engine. I use Google, uh, Google News and I just get an email every night about Hanford News, what's, what's happened there that has been, that someone's written a news article about. So if you have other ideas, I mean this is just a really simple list to start you off. But if you have other ideas and you need help putting it together, or if you have questions about something that's happened at Hanford or you'd like a resource, just contact us. Don't ever hesitate to let us know when you have something going on and you'd like help. So again, thank you so much for your participation in the Hanford Leadership Initiative. We really appreciate it. We hope you've enjoyed it. And if you haven't, if you haven't, let us know through the feedback survey that I sent you yesterday. So if you have any questions for me or for Ken, feel free to send them now. All right, thank you, Becky. And uh, I, I do want to offer up uh, myself and my staff as, as a resource as well. If you, uh, if you do want to become involved, um, uh, me and my staff are, are certainly a resource as well and available to you. So let me get back to one question that was asked earlier about uh, a milliram and a rem. Uh, and just very quickly, uh, a rem is a unit of radiation exposure. A rem is a, is a fairly significant amount of exposure. Uh, a milliram is a thousandth of a rem. So just to give you a couple of numbers as well, hopefully to put this into perspective, uh, if you are a trained worker in a radiation field, you are allowed to receive, because they, the 
expectation is that you're informed of what the risk is and being compensated for that, you are allowed in a one-year period to receive a dose of up to 5 rem or 5,000 millirem. If you're a member of the public and somebody is operating some nuclear uh, whatever in your area, they are allowed to not exceed an exposure to you of more than 100 millirem during a one-year period. So they're, they're limited to 100 millirem exposure to the public um, during a one-year period. And, and again, so the, the numbers we were talking about earlier with the, with the trucks, uh, 200 millirem per hour at the surface. So uh, we were seeing significantly lower levels of radiation exposure from those trucks. So I hope that helps clarify it a little bit. So one question we have uh, had asked is about have there been any major accidents in the past decade? And, and I do realize I neglected to talk with any detail about, about accidents. Since uh, Oregon began its program, and even slightly before, but when I took this program over uh, with transportation in the early 1990s and digging through the, the documents that we had and the accident records, uh, there was one back in January 1969 that was fairly minor, another one 1981, 82, 85. We have had, you know, during that period, perhaps 15 accidents involving radioactive materials in the state of Oregon. And I'll talk broader as well in just a minute. But within the state of Oregon, maybe 15 accidents in the last 30 years, uh, one involving a rollover, uh, one we had a couple of years ago, a, a truck jackknifed and slid against a rock wall near Legrand. In none of those occasions have we had a release of radioactive materials from, from any of those shipments. There was an accident uh, in the Hanford area, just in, uh, in the Richland, Washington area, um, back in, uh, let's see if I can find it on my list here. In December of 1987, it was New Year's Eve, a truck carrying contaminated dirt in six large metal boxes overturned and spilled that all over the place. Uh, and again, if you go back to what I was talking about with the packaging requirements, because there was such a low level of radiation involved with these shipments, uh, the fact that it spilled out was really not of major consequence. And basically, they put people with put booties on their, on their shoes and people with shovels, and they, they cleaned it up. So the accidents we've had in Oregon have been, been relatively minor. The accidents that we would most be concerned about at a, at a national level or a local level would, would be an accident involving a Type B container, because those are the, the shipping containers that, that involve the highest level of radioactivity within them. There have been accidents, and there have been some serious accidents over the years uh, involving some of those shipments. Still fairly infrequent, because the, the total number of shipments is not that large. And in those shipments, we have not had an, an incident where a Type B container has, has ruptured or been damaged such that it lost its contents. So there have been some accidents. Um, you know, that's not to say that there can't be something uh, worse to come. Uh, that's why, you know, the regulations strictly really talk about the package being the end-all be-all. And I talked earlier about, you know, the Western states are saying, you know, there are other things you can do in terms of having very qualified drivers and very well-maintained trucks and keeping the trucks off the road when the snow is flying that is going to do an awful lot to reduce the likelihood of an accident. So there's things you can add on there, I think, that, that uh, help reduce the likelihood of an accident. And, uh, and then if there is one, that's, that's why you train those emergency responders and, and uh, hope that training kicks in and they, they do what they're supposed to do. So other questions for you. Seeing, uh, hope we didn't put you all to sleep. I'm not seeing too many uh, two questions coming up this way yet. And we, you know, we certainly can end early if need be. Uh, but again, we are willing to look 
uh, or to respond to questions right now beyond just the transportation issue. If you want to uh, raise an issue that came up that's been stewing in your mind the last couple of weeks from groundwater or tank issues, we have some new developments regarding the leaking double shell tank at Hanford. If you haven't heard, we can talk about that. Or we can wrap this up early if you like. So let's see. We did get a question. If it hasn't been moved already, what is the timetable for the transportation of the spent fuel at Oregon State's trigger reactor after the refuel? So there is a, I mentioned earlier, a, a research reactor at Oregon State University. The truck that I showed you that had the, um, um, let me see if I can just get there really quick without driving you crazy too much. All right, just about there. So this truck actually is the truck that was hauling the radioactive material, the spent nuclear fuel, from the Oregon State reactor a couple of years ago. Um, their fuel was changed out at Oregon State. I don't recall the exact year. It was roughly three or four years ago. Uh, and then they also, there is a research reactor at Reed College as well in the Portland area. And they also changed out their reactor fuel about two years ago. So both these reactors now uh, do not anticipate uh, changing their fuel out again. They will run until the reactors are shut down. So a question, do we see a tension between states not wanting to keep waste within their borders or within nearby states not wanting to ship it on the roads? Um, how the public perceives the risk of shipping versus storing, which is a really good question because it is something that comes up. We have, and, and it's unfortunately that the answer is pretty complicated because uh, with all these nuclear issues, there's a lot of different moving parts to it. Uh, a lot of people, I think, sincerely are very concerned about the transportation of radioactive materials. Uh, you know, I've talked with them at, at, uh, at public meetings. You know, they've heard a lot of the presentation I just gave you, and, you know, it doesn't matter. They, they believe it's a, a very big risk and one they would rather not, not face. Uh, we have had some people who have said that they would prefer all the ways to stay at Hanford because they don't think it can be transported safely. Uh, we've had some people who admit to me that they do want, want ways to be transported safely because they think that just encourages the expansion of nuclear power, and they would not like that to happen. So there's a lot of different elements to that. We definitely have people who are upset at the idea, and we have seen attempts to inflame the public with a lot of misinformation about this topic by talking about thousands of truckloads of waste coming through Portland or Hood River, irradiating people, you know, willy-nilly as they go by. And, and, you know, yes, there are trucks on the road. You know, yes, there is a risk. But, you know, those, those instances in terms of numbers of shipments through Portland, through Hood River, the radiation exposure is, is really not the case. Uh, let me look at the next question. So research going on to find alternative uses for the waste products that could alleviate the quantity of waste needing to be disposed of. There, there's, there is a use for some of the radioactive materials. Some, some have been used as a radiation, a radiation source. In fact, at one point, there was an attempt, actually a successful attempt, to remove cesium and strontium out of the high-level waste tanks at Hanford. Uh, fairly significant amounts were removed, and it was sent out to commercial industries to be used to sterilize medical equipment and meat and other uh, consumer products. Uh, they had a pinhole leak in one of those, and they canceled the whole program and brought them back to Hanford. Uh, so there, there is use, and that's just one example for some of the materials, the problem when you look at Hanford and you look at the other sites is, in most cases, the waste product is so dispersed among soil or water or building material that 
it, it really is, is impossible to extract that out or very, very difficult, and, and you really wouldn't have much in the way of reducing the mass quantities. Where does radioactive material being transported go? Well, in some cases, as, as I talked about with Hanford in the 60s and 70s and 80s, a lot of the waste coming from those Department of Energy sites around the country went to Hanford for disposal. And, and really, the kind of the, the law in terms of disposal and the principles behind disposal is that the high-level waste, as I mentioned, the highly radioactive and very long-lived radioactive material is intended to be isolated from the public for thousands of years and, and isolated from the environment. So that's where you get into deep geologic disposal. So the commercial fuels, I talked about the spent nuclear fuel at Hanford. If they ever do vitrify and immobilize a high-level waste at Hanford, that is intended to go into deep geologic disposal but since there isn't a site, it's not going anywhere. Transuranic waste is going to this one site in New Mexico for burial. Commercial low-level radioactive waste, there, is, there are five operating commercial disposal sites in the country. The one at Hanford that 11 states can send to. There's one in uh, South Carolina, one in Utah, I think I said five, I think there's just four, and one just opened up in the state of Texas. Um, and then the Department of Energy, because it is not able to send most of its low-level waste for disposal to Hanford, has opened a new disposal facility in the state of Nevada on uh, what's called the Nevada Test Site, although they've since changed that name, the Nevada Nuclear Security Site or something. Can't keep track of them. Uh, so basically it's, you know, fairly shallow surface disposal at a few isolated locations in the United States. What else do we have? That's it. That's it for questions. Anything else? We're, I'm not going to, you know, draw it out of you if you're, uh, if, you're all, if you're all done with this. Again, I do want to express my thanks for your participation. This was a new venture for us. We, uh, we had never done a, uh, a webinar series for students and uh, I'd like to thank Becky for all the work she did in organizing this and prompting us to uh, to reach out a little bit and stretch ourselves a bit. We have now um, I think five very good presentations that can be adapted for similar use so we may do this uh, in the future. Um, it would be very important for us to see your your feedback uh, we're aware of the technical problems. Um, you know, I think we've gotten better at them, but uh, it still probably wouldn't hurt to point a few things out if you see see what those are. Uh, but but certainly the content, uh, the marketing, um, you know, any suggestions you might have, uh, whether this is a topic that you think uh, really would would be a big issue. So we got a, another question. If you were to say that Odo had to fight US DOE on any one issue, what issue would that be? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you kind of a broader answer to that. I think, I think really the, the answer is the, would be summed up as the quality of cleanup at Hanford. Uh, we've talked in the past about whether or not a lot of waste should stay in the ground at Hanford. Um, you know, it's in the Department of Energy's, U.S. Department of Energy's mind, it is a lot cheaper to leave waste where it is rather than to go after it, put it through some treatment process to immobilize or neutralize it, and then move it maybe only a mile or two or five or six but to a better place, an engineer disposal facility at Hanford. Um, that's, I think, likely to be, you know, the biggest ongoing fight. We've already had a bit of a battle over a couple of individual waste sites. Uh, there are still a lot of decisions yet to be made. Uh, 
in terms of Hanford CleanNet that we'll see over the next many years. And really a lot of it does boil down to how, how good is the cleanup going to be? How lasting is it going to be? What will be the repercussions in the future if we don't do better? So that's that what's what my answer would be. So again, I think uh, I think we will sign off here. Thank you again for your participation. Please fill out those uh, uh, surveys that Becky has sent you. Uh, please feel free to contact me or Becky in the future. And uh, good luck to you. I hope to see you at uh, some Hanford event in the future.